Hello, everybody. Jimmy here, Veganic Grower here in Boilo. Hope everybody is doing well tonight. Um, here, it's 20 degrees Celsius. It is humid. It is raining. Over the last month, we've had over eight inches of rain, over 215 millimeters of rain, and the fields are just a mess. It's, it's, it's a swamp. It is the worst swamp I've ever seen since 2017. Um, so here we were supposed to start delivering our veggies next week and we're going to have to postpone a week because our first arugula and rapini and mizuna and broccoli and bok choy and cone cabbage have either all stunned it or outright rotted. It's just, it's just that wet. And there's really nothing you can do when you have that kind of moisture. You can pretty much deter everything else if it's too drought you can water more if it's too sunny you can put shade cloth if it's too cloudy well you just hope the sun comes but if there's too much rain there's just too much rain and you can't do anything it's not like we irrigate when it's raining anyway besides the point so it's been a the sun is acogene pizzas and sugar from nova scotia and hello chris oh, okay we're back and hello, Chris from Northern California. Great to have you with us and happy summer solstice to everyone. I hope you're experiencing some nice, warm, sunny conditions. Um, hello, Susan from Northern California. And yeah, very dry this week, I'm sure. Northern California is usually dry. And hello, Catherine from Quebec City again. Good, so tonight's show is one of my favorite, favorite topics, one of the most misunderstood, most least talked about, the least researched, the least studied, all about insects. It's what drives our entire world. They're the, they're the vast realm of species that we inhabit this beautiful planet with, and we almost know nothing about them. They, they, they exist, and we call them pests, and we call them problems, and we call them threats. And you know what? Tonight, we're going to talk, talk about it in a whole, whole different light. It's kind of what we do here on the weekend. Pressures, how to deter self-pollination of squashes. If we don't have the pollinators come, like sometimes happens up here in the north uh, at the right times, and dehydration and why it's important. Not so like somebody mentioned dehydration of farmers, but dehydration of fruits and vegetables and herbs. So, all right, let's go. Um, actually, no, before I go, there's a couple of questions that came in that actually talk about some things from last time's show. Uh, so I want to address those because I think they're really important when we were talking about cover cropping and weeding and also the warm and settled dates. So one question that came over from Jean from Nova Scotia was, um, can I plant buckwheat with asparagus that's going to fern as a cover crop? Uh, I've never tried it and I thought it was a really brilliant idea. So yeah, Gene, go for it. I think you already might've tried it. So if you have, let us know, uh, how it's working out, but yeah, I think that's a great idea because asparagus goes to fern. It's pretty much done very fast and the buckwheat can come in. It can start flowering and uh, bees can have something to play with. Other insect species can have something to eat. So yeah, I think it's a great idea. Brilliant, brilliant suggestion, brilliant idea. One other question, James from the San Francisco Bay Area asks or talks about, my melon plants are lethargic. Do you have any advice? So what I suggested to James was to go ahead and put compost on, and he has all his plants in raised beds in, northern, in the Bay Area of California. He lives in Walnut Creek. Uh, put compost around the plants before you water the next time, and then water really deeply. And it should should do you just fine. Uh, so James did. He got some good veganic compost. He put it around his melon plants. And he wrote me uh, last week and he said, they're doing great. And uh, they're really, really thriving and they're running. So there you go. Another tick on the uh, old chalkboard of how veganics works all the time. So there you go. And hello, Judd from Napierville. Welcome. Two questions before we started. Okay, so insect presence, how to attract, often overlooked. Uh, insects are around us all the time. Some people have researched and said that 
if insects didn't exist, we wouldn't have a planet. Um, of course, we, there are the pollinating insects that pollinate just not the foods we eat, but also flowers and other, other um, fruiting plants that other animals eat that without the pollinating insects, it wouldn't exist. So the whole chain would be broken. It was actually something else that I, I had researched at one time that I thought was very interesting that without ants who are like underground engineers, without ants, who, and they create those corridors and they create their, their mounds, without ants the entire earth supposedly would collapse upon itself. So you look at that little ant, you look at that little ant in your garden and you say, oh my gosh, you know, what am I going to do? They're eating a few of my bean plants. They make those big mounds. They sting me because they're red ants of like the Southwest or Texas. And, and in the end, if we didn't have them, <laughs> we would fall in upon ourselves. So Think about that next time we, we, we talk about insects. However, I think most people here are vegan, so most people don't do anything for insects, which is good. They just let them live. And this is the central belief in veganic growing is that we want to have all beings thrive. We want to plant a diversity to bring a diversity of flora and fauna. The more diversity that we have, the more diversity we have. It's going to... It's almost like when you plant more, there are companion plants that decide that they want to grow, native flora that decide that they want to grow right with all of those other plants that you've planted yourself. It's just that it all decides it wants to work together. So it's a really incredible system if we just let it thrive and flourish. But it's not only just about diversity. And like I was talking about at the beginning of the show, we've had so much rain that we lost a bunch of crops in the beginning, but it doesn't mean our entire selling season is lost because not only do we plant a diversity, over 400 different kinds of annu annuals and perennials here on our farm, we have successions of say beans, for example. And this is a little bit off topic, but I thought it was very interesting. Sorry, my connection is unstable, so. I'm back. Um, so let's say beans, for example, so we plant five, six in May, then the first, the last week of May, we plant another one, a week later, first week of June, June, another one. And the great thing about beans is you wouldn't really consider them to be, my connection is bad. Okay, I'm back. I'm sorry, my connection is bad. Hello, Meg, and hello, Margaret from Saskatchewan. Margaret, tell us, I hope you didn't get inundated by the flooding in Saskatoon that we saw on CBC News and Mateo Media. I, I hope you're okay over there. So anyway, and I'm sorry, my we've had a lot of weirdness with our, with our weather, so uh, I'm hoping not to be too unstable. Um, so we grow five different successions of beans. And the interesting thing about beans, usually when associate bean plants, and I'm talking uh, snap beans, you wouldn't usually associate them with a lot of insect species. But what I've learned is, and what I've observed, which is even stronger than what I've learned, is that the bumblebees adore the flowers. Now it's interesting because a bean is a perfect flower. So you can plant one type of snap bean next to another kind of snap bean, and it's pretty much 100% likely that you're gonna get a true variety from both if you decide to save those seeds. But what I learned is that because the flowers are so small, but the bumblebees love the flavor, what they do is they kind of hang upside down on the flower and they shake the flower, which is awesome because that's exactly how you pollinate a self-pollinating, a self-fertilizing self flower, a uh, flower that has the pistil and the stamen in the same flower, is that you need to shake it. You need to trip it. You do this with your tomato plants. So the bumblebee does the same thing. He hangs his eye down and he shakes the, shakes the flower and then it pollinates. Ah, it's just absolutely fascinating. So, and hello, Anne from St. Lazar. Welcome. So I think everybody's there. Perfect. So yeah, so there you go. The, the point is to have a diversity of plants for diversity of flora and fauna, but also to plant successions, plant greens that can go to flower, plant greens for you to eat, uh, plant greens for biomass. If you're talking like mustard greens, which if you grow a certain kind of mustard green can get a lot of biomass very quick, creates incredible, credible habitat for ground beetles and spiders and 
uh, for gopher snakes. And I know Susan shared us a picture of a rattlesnake. I used to have them in Arizona in my gardens from time to time. And well, they're, they're fine if you don't provoke them. <laughs> they're, they're quite pretty also, I find. But uh, it can be quite a shock if you see them in your garden. So here we have gopher snakes. We have green green snakes. No, none of these snakes here are poisonous, and they're just a joy to have around. So who are we trying to attract into our gardens? What insects specifically are we trying to attract? Well, if you think about it in two different categories, you can look at it as arthropods and pollinators. And we'll talk about the pollinators first. So the pollinators are your bees, your wasps, your hoverflies, your moths, your butterflies, the sphinx moths, those really cool looking hummingbird moths that come and pollinate for you. And the more flowers that you're going to have, and again, it's all about diversity and succession. The more flowers that you're going to have flowering at all times during the year, it's going to give enough food for all of those beings to share. Now, I shared a picture on Facebook this week of sort of a strawberry patch that just got taken over by the native flora. And in years past, we would fight that. We would fight and fight and fight and fight. Um, hold on, I'm going to answer a question. Does it make sense? Mellow Earth, do you mean I don't have to freak out about a rattlesnake? They won't attack me unless provoked? I have been around a lot of rattlesnakes in Arizona and New Mexico, and I have never been attacked by just being with them. Saying that, if you end up getting into their space and you scare them, they're gonna, they're gonna, they're gonna attack you. Um, but I have situations where I was really close. I was within as close as I am to my screen of a rattlesnake and she, she or he just sat there in the bush. So I don't know. It depends um, uh, how aggressive they are. And these were pretty aggressive. These were Hopi rattlesnakes. They were small ones. Um, and they tended to be very aggressive. But I don't know. You know, I wasn't a threat. They didn't feel I was a threat. I wasn't trying to steal their prey. And I wasn't to touch them. So I think it was OK. I think it was OK. So anyway. I wouldn't say go and hang out with them and, you know, have a, have a, have a, have a snack, but if you come around them, you'll be okay. Margaret Henderson, no flooding in Watson. We got just enough rain. Everything's rugged. Awesome. That's good news. I'm glad to hear that. So back to pollinators, the bees, wasps, hoverflies, moths, and butterflies, planning a diversity, planning a succession. You want the flowers to come in as early as possible. So if I think about what we do here, the earliest flowers that come in are usually like the chai flowers and the dandelions. And there was this whole push this year in Quebec and Ontario not to cut your grass for the bees. Don't don't cut your grass. Well, it's going to be really interesting. And I'm kind of laughing. I'm glad that they did that. I think it's great. Um, but <laughs> once the flowers are gone, everything goes to seed. These same people are going to have thousands of dandelions in their small space. Me, I think it's great because the dandelions eventually, uh, they die off and, and at least the bees have had something to eat during that time where there isn't much. And the great thing is about dandelions too is they're drought resistant. Uh, they, they're more profuse when it rains, but if it's a drought condition, they still go to flower. So it's beautiful. It's a beautiful situation. And then, of course, the chai flowers. But going all the way through the season, when we're talking about annuals and perennials and all of the different flowering plants that we grow for us to eat and for them to eat, um, then we come to the end of the season where we have the goldenrod. And anybody who lives in, in the North Country knows about goldenrod. Um, and goldenrod is a beautiful, stocky, almost a grass-like, native flora that creates this beautiful elongated yellow-ish flower system and the bees go nuts and of course it starts flowering in august and continues all, all the way until basically the first frost in september and the bees go nuts but without that they don't have enough nourishment that they need to go ahead and get through their time in the winter if they don't die off because sometimes they just naturally die on their own depending on their cycle so interesting to think Think about everything flowering at different times. So what's very common is a lot of people will plant everything all at once. Well, if you do all that, sure, you're going to have a lot of food all at once also. But again, you're not really helping to attract all the beings that you need to attract unless 
you're doing different succession. Also, unless you're letting volunteers happen, which is the great thing about allowing some of your earliest crops, like your lettuces and your mustard greens and uh, go to seed. If you let them go to seed, go to flowering the seed, and then some of the seed you collect and some of the seed falls onto the ground. Well, in the fall, some of that will re-sprout. So then you have the whole cycle plus more food for yourself and you didn't have to do any extra work. I like it. Uh, continuing on, arthropods. So the arthropods are definitely an uh, unappreciated species. You see, people see a spider running across the room and they say, oh, I need to get that out of there. They see a beetle and they think it's just a bad beetle. But uh, I think it was Meg on, I think it was a Learn Veganic course that I took this last spring, which is super good, by the way. If you guys have a chance to check it out, check it out next year. It's really, really good. I was saying about 3% of all of the insect species are actually going to cause damage to your crops. And that's true. And so when you look out into your fields and you see all those beetles, chances are most of them are just doing their, having their life. They're, they're just part of the cycle of, of, of the natural system that you've created in your veganic gardening system. So the thing that arthropods really like is canopy cover. So if you plant a, a nice mix of mustard greens or greens again, or you got your perennials and you're doing your companion plantings of perennials and annuals, and you're creating those systems, if you if you let everything grow profusely, like ha happening to Margaret there in, in uh, Watson, and you kind of dig away a little bit and you look, look you're going to see a lot of action. Now, also keep in mind that your soil is basically made up of really tiny arthropods, as well as bacteria, as well as nematodes. But on a really small microscopic level, those arthropods are probably the most important insect being we have because they are soil. And of course, all of these beings will then play their own part. They'll die and decompose and create the soil. They'll, they'll pollinate for us. They'll, they'll eat other beings because that's the natural world. And as vegans, we have the choice to be able to, and I think everybody's vegan, but if you're not, you should be. Uh, as vegans, we have the choice to, to exploit animals or not. And as vegans, we've decided not to. But the insect world and other beings, they don't have this choice. They're made the way they are. And this is something we will always need to understand. And actually people who doubt that veganic farming and veganic farmers are viable will actually point out to us is that well nature isn't vegan it's like no of course it's not vegan our soil is not vegan our soil is just decomposing dying eating each other all the time i get that but it has nothing to do with exploiting animals we're not exploiting each other even natural world they're eating what they need to they leave others alone it's not like a a carnivorous uh, arthropod is just eating all the time. You know, it's eating, and it's living its life. It's making babies. So there you go. Like, it's, I understand the way the natural system works. And as vegans, we need to understand that this is going to occur. And we need to have the system in place. We need to have the natural system working. What we don't need is any kind of exploitation of animals in our system. Well, hopefully, that's all clear for everybody else who's going to watch later who's not vegan. It's not just about attracting insects though. And it's not, uh, it is also about attracting birds and bats and small mammals. Um, I also shared a couple of pictures of, we have a Phoebe nest that uh, for the last three years has nested right above where I have my farm kiosk here in a few weeks. And we put up houses for the tree swallows because they really like our environment. And supposedly it's actually a testament to your diverse conditions, that if birds come back and they nest in the exact same location, it means that either they themselves or their generations of children have decided that there's enough food, there's enough water, there's enough cover, and there's enough of everything else that they want to live and thrive. So if you have the same birds come back to your space every year, then you should say, bravo, you've done what you can for the beings that wish to live there. So I find that really cool. So I brought props. Um, I always bring props. I brought props last week too, but I brought props. And these are my favorite, favorite field guides. Now, I'm sure as gardeners, you have gardening books, and I'm sure even some of you are naturalist enthusiasts. And 
if you if you're not i have to say you should be because by having a gardening system you're actually having that wonderful opportunity to learn all about the natural world as well but you just need to have a reference to it and it's so much more fun to be sitting looking at a bird and looking through a bird book than looking at a bird and then looking on your computer and trying to figure out what it is so my favorite 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 i've been a naturalist even longer than i've been a farmer it's going to be ooh, a long time it's going it's going to be almost 30 years so my favorite bird book the Sibley Guide to Birds. This gentleman is brilliant. All of his pictures are hand drawn. He actually does one for the East and for the West. They're in a smaller version, but if you can get the big one, then you have every species in all of North America and Canada. Very, very awesome Sibley Guide to Birds. If you're into butterflies, uh, I'm, I can't say this is my absolute favorite, but it is a really good definitive guide. The Swift Guide to Butterflies um, has pretty much anything you'll see. Now, there are always going to be some, and sometimes you can find better ones regionally. If you go to your, oh, I'm not going to know the way to say this, but there's a, there's a really good name for butterfly groups out there. Anyway, I don't know the name, but if you have a butterfly group in your region, sometimes they put out their own publications, look for it, and then you'll be able to get a better idea of what's going on with butterflies and sometimes even moths in your own neck of the woods. And my last one, this one I really, really like, and I really like the cover because praying mantises are just cool. Field Guide to Insects and Spiders of North America. Definitely not inclusive. There are there are millions of insect species in the United States and Canada, and obviously they can't cover them all. But the cool thing is, is that you can narrow it down. And what I've noticed is if you take the, if you see something in the field and you take it and you kind of get the idea on maybe what the family might be, you can go and then research. And Iowa State University has a really, really awesome website once you get an idea of what you're looking for, and it's just simply called the bug guide. And it really has everything. And it has pictures and it has diagrams and it's brilliant. So get to know what's going on around you and you'll and you'll even have better luck. You'll even have a better time of it. I also have a reptile and amphibian guide. I have a mam a mammal guide. Um, I have a tracks guide because we like to track in the snow. So there you go. Get 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 to know what's living where you live. So why are birds and bats and small mammals important? Well, small mammals, let's talk about them. I was talking about ants and being sort of engineers, underground engineers. Well, moles and voles do the same. A vole is an is a herbivorous being, while a mole is an omnivorous being. Uh, but they both do the same thing. They create tunnels through the soil. And I don't know why they do this. Maybe they're doing it for other creatures. Maybe they're doing it for themselves. But again, I, I want to, I, I just have to believe that they're doing it for some sort of engineering capability of helping to build and hold the soil up based on what they're trying to do. It's kind of like the idea of a beaver when they create a pond, when they, when they block a river and they create these sort of swampy pond areas they're not just doing it for themselves. My guess is they're doing it for a whole other gang of other beings. And we just don't even know because we don't spend enough time to study them. So think about these things. Think about these things a little differently when we're looking at it. So small mammals in the gardens are good. Yes, of course, they do eat some of your green matter. I've had, um, I've had voles and shrews eat I planted a, a batch of 65 or 70 broccoli plants uh, in early summer last year. I think they ate 20. Well, they ate 20. You know, yeah, it sucks. But you, you got to understand that they were here first. And I understand that they were here first. So we share as best as we can. Bats. Bats are amazing. We are losing bat species in North America because we're spraying for the beings that they like to eat. Maybe mainly mosquitoes and black flies. Um, the waterways to, to, to make those pesky mosquitoes uh, go away. Well, we're losing the bat species because at night they eat millions, millions of mosquitoes. And by not having the mosquitoes for them to eat, they can't, they can't eat themselves. They can't raise their children. Birds are the same way. We're having an incredible downfall in barn swallows. 
And there's two reasons. One, we're because we're spraying the hell out of our fields everywhere. So the eradicating farmland everywhere, barn swallows need old barns. I'm back. <laughs> barn swallows need old barns to be able to nest in. This is what they like to use. So by having more farmable land, even old farms, even old barns, and we're going to be able to create these barn swallow, these barn swallow colonies again. And again, they're going to fly around, especially up here. They're going to eat those black flies and they're going to eat those noceums. And in Arizona, I had cedar gnats and they would eat those as well. So it's important to have these beings. It's important to have them living within our gardening systems. Presence and how to attract them. Good. So let me see if there were any questions about, about attracting insects. No, but there was one about birds that I thought was good. Jean from Nova Scotia. And we just, I also posted, we, we are, we just finished up our, our best Hascap uh, harvest ever. Uh, we had over 10 kilos from, from 20 fruiting shrubs and they're not very old. They're only about three or four years old. Uh, and I probably even could have been two or three kilos more. So in kilos for you people in California, kilos are going to be about 22 and a half pounds, 23 pounds. So it was quite a harvest. And I got to freeze a lot of bags for the winter time, which is really cool. Um, but yeah, we have cedar waxwings. So wait, they'll, the, they, <laughs> they actually will go onto the other side of the bush while I'm harvesting get really cheeky and try to eat one while I'm harvesting. Then they see me ah, and then they fly off. So yeah, the cedar waxwings are there. The American robins have already had their babies. So they will all like to eat them. So what I do, um, because we do want to have some of the harvest and eventually we will share with them. Um, we will go ahead and cover uh, the, the hascap bushes with an insect screen, the same insect screen that we use to cover our brassicas. And I'm going to talk all about what to do about insects that are problematic here in a minute about insect screens. And it works wonders. I mean, it's a little bit difficult to keep down because it's so windy, but we put a big sandbag on one side and a sandbag on the other, and it holds it quite taut. And I check it every few hours if I know that it's windy just to make sure it's on. And it's just enough deterrent, even if it does sort of fall off, they don't like the fact that there's something else there. So they're there, they're up in the trees, they're waiting, they're yelling at me saying, give me some hascap berries, but, um, but we want to harvest what we want to harvest. But because I understand that they also want to eat those fruits to raise their children and they're super important for our ecosystem in whatever way they are important to their it doesn't even matter that they're important. They're just, they just, they're just part of the, they're just part of our world and they deserve to live period. So after we've harvested what we think is our, is a good amount, then we'll go ahead and just uncover it and let them eat the rest. It is amazing how fast they'll eat them. So if you live in a place where you grow small fruits and you want to keep some for yourself, then you do have to cover it with something. Uh, insect screen is great. It's very lightweight. It's like a mos mosquito screen. It, it doesn't, it doesn't weigh anything. It doesn't seem to hurt anything, even hold really taut. The plants just kind of bounce back and now they're just, they're just growing, thriving like they should. So think about that if you're, if you're trying to harvest before the birds do, because if you do leave them uncovered, it is assured that they're going to find them. And as soon as they're ready, you're going to find them like they do in the strawberry patch. And the thing about the strawberries, they don't eat the whole strawberry sometimes. They just eat a nice half of it. <laughs> and of course the ripest ones. Anyway, so there you go. So try an insect screen on your berry bushes and, and it really, really does work wonders. Okay, so now to that sort of 3%, I'm going to go. Now in agriculture, agronomy, they call this in pest, insect pest management, IPM. And insect pest management is just a sad term because they're not pests. They're, who are they pests to? Us? Are monoculture, monocultures of corn and, and, and corn borers? Like, is this why they're pests? Because we decided to plant thousands of acres or uh, cucumber beetles because we have thousand acre farms of potatoes from here all the way across Canada. Like, who's the pest? 
I, I don't understand. So we're going to call it something different. They call it an integrated insect management. They probably even have a cooler term. If they talk to each other, they probably even had a cooler term. But let's talk, let's call it integrated insect management. They're not pests. They're here for their own reasons, their own purposes. And again, just because they want to be here and they want to thrive. That's it. Um, that's right, Catherine. Humans are the pests to animals and insects. Yeah, that's that's it. <laughs> Okay, so you know what? I'm going to answer a couple of these questions. So Catherine asks, I guess that would apply to fruit trees too, insect screens. Yeah, I would think that you would need pretty large ones. And I've never tried it, so I don't know how well it would work. Um, but if you are trying to protect, say, a dwarf tree from from animal or bird insect species, I'm sorry, bird species that are wanting to eat your fruits, then yeah, you can try it. The other thing, again, that I would always say is plant a diversity, especially diversity of another kind of fruit or something else that that being likes. And again, it's about observation. So find out who they are. The great thing about Jean's question is she knew right away that they were cedar waxlings. So I knew right away how to sort of react to that. But if people say birds, or if people say insect, or if people say white fly, uh, I'm sorry, white moth, you know, yeah, maybe I can figure it out or other people can figure out, but it's better if you do a little bit of your own research and figure out what it is that you have challenges with so that you can create the habitat that they would prefer. Most of the time, they're only eating the things that we have growing because the rest of the native environment that they want isn't there. That's a light bulb moment. I love it. Okay, so continuing on. Um as veganic growers, we really need to get into an idea of something that we should never, ever spray. Any kind of insecticide, any kind of organicide, any kind of home method of garlic spray or pepper spray. We should not spray anything to deter insects. And the reason why is this. We have no idea what we're doing by doing that. So if we spray a garlic spray for, say, aphids, and we kill some of the aphids. Well, who was eating the aphids? Who was doing that work because that was their food source of eating those aphids or rounding up those aphids before we sprayed? And if we don't know, then if we, if we, the thing about spraying is that usually it's not 100% uh, effective anyway. So if it, but if it's 90% effective, you're still going to have your crops get eaten by the insect that was a problem for that specific crop. But the predators that were going to come and help control and help work within the natural system are going to leave. They're going to go find a place where there is more prevalence of the insect species. And this is why we shouldn't spray. Because you're, by, by creating the diversity of flora, you're inviting all these insects in, but then by then changing it and spraying certain crops because you have a certain issue, well, you're just defeating the whole purpose. You're just counterbalancing all the balance that we're trying to create. I always laugh also as I'm, as I, since I became a veganic grower and, and started really thinking about it in 2014, I always laugh now when I read things about, oh, this is what I have to do for squash vine borers. And that's actually a question I'm going to talk about here in a minute. I have to take all my plants out and I have to burn them. And that's what the agronomist said. And if I read at my local cooperative university extension, that's what they say. I have to have clear fields and don't put them back for seven years. And it's going to, it's awful if you don't. Well, we have never gotten rid of these bugs. A squash vine borer, in my guess, is probably more prevalent now than it ever has been with all of these methods that everybody has advised us to do. Spraying and clearing our fields and pulling out plants and burning and tilling it under and getting rid of compost and getting rid of all the straw that we're using. Yeah, it's the problem still, the, the, the bug is still there and it's always going to be. So instead, let's look at it differently. So this was a question from Amy from Ithaca, New York. Squash vine borer. So the recommendation of agronomes is to remove the plants. What do you think? Well, what I think is leave the plants. 
Yes, okay, the squash vine borers maybe will burrow into the soil, and then in the following spring, they'll come up. Now, if you're like me, I'm not going to plant my squash in the exact same place that I planted the squash the year before, because it's probably just not a prudent thing to do. It, it's probably fine, and if you if you talk to permaculturists, they'll say, yeah, you can just plant, you can plant the same stuff pretty much here, you can, in, in the same place, and and, uh, but for me, I like the idea of rotation because I think that as, as nematodes build up in the soil, I think this is where I might have a lot of problems. So if instead of placing my cucurbits in the same spot every year, I rotate them around. So maybe they come back every four years. Well, let's just say, for example, I have squash vine borers, which we don't have here as a problem, but let's just say we have squash vine borers and they live there. Well, if, there are a few that live in the soil that survive the winter for whatever reason. And I plant, say, greens thereafter. They're not going to have anything to eat. So now they're going to have to go and travel off. And here's the other interesting point. Most of these bugs are also migratory. So they don't only have one generation that lives in the soil. Colorado potato beetles, which I'm going to talk about here in a minute, more they have up to four generations and they have the ones that do live in the soil that come up every year in the spring if they survive and then they have we have the ones that migrate in and then more that migrate in and then more that migrate in and then the ones that make babies that then have their babies that become full adults so the cycle continues so if you're spraying you're only going to maybe take care of one cycle but if you let nature balance itself and the only way it's going to ever balance itself herself, excuse me, is if there is enough of them. So you can't just have one Colorado potato beetle to bring in the assassin beetles or the spine soldier bugs. You're going to need maybe a dozen or maybe 25 or 30. And I'm not saying leave them all there to chomp all your plants because they will. The larva will eat a potato plant very quickly, but you need to have some there. And by spraying, you're going to deter. So there is a better method for almost all insect beings if we do need to control and of course we are going to have problems and i'm going to talk about the most notorious from my experiences in arizona and quebec here in a second and that is to hand pick them off so if you have the adult colorado potato beetles and you know that they're going to lay eggs and when they lay eggs they're going to be up to 20 to 50 and then those larvae are going to come out and as soon as those larvae come out they voraciously feed and they will decimate a potato plant in about three days. It's it's that fast. So take them off. If you don't like to squish them because you don't think that's vegan enough for you, well then just take them, put them in a jar, walk somewhere off on your property and dump them out. You might have to go back every couple of days and take the same ones off, but eventually they'll figure it out. They're not going to come back. The same thing is with most, most insects is that as a human being, we can just pick them off. Just like think of it as if a mosquito is biting you, you're not going to just go, oh, wow, look at that. He's full of blood. Oh, that doesn't hurt. No, you're going you're gonna to smack it. But if a mosquito is just around, you're not going to spray it and kill it because it's just around. Same philosophy. Let insect beings be. If it, you know it's going to be too big of a problem, then do something about it. And there's a way. So I'm going to talk about, I have about seven or eight that have the, been the most notorious. And I'm going to go pretty fast. And says, picking potato beetle, beetle, potato bugs is my mother's summer job on the family farm. Yeah, I'm sure she liked it. It's a lot of fun. Okay. The most notorious is what is called a gray cutworm. Um, it's gray. It is the larva of a, um, of a night flying moth called a hawk moth. And they are terrible this year. Oh, they are in everything. They're in the beans, they're in the peas, they're in the they're in the potatoes, they're in the onions, they're in the tomato plants. And because of their their methods, they live in the soil during the day, and at night they come out when the light goes down, and they will bite the plant to the point where they just chew the plant off. And the, the, the plant will fall over dead and it's done. Like it's, they're an awful, awful, awful being for those plants. So because these are a lot of the plants that we're trying to grow and they're so prolific, when we see a plant that's been cut 
because we don't do anything about it before. When we see a plant that's been cut, then we dig around the base of the plant and we find the worm. And then we either kind of throw it outside of the garden or we squeeze it. Uh, Catherine, where do you dispose of them? Larva, eggs, etc. in the garbage can, another natural place away from your garden. Yeah, like I said, you can either squeeze them, kill them, because they might come back, or you can, yeah, just dispose of them in another natural space. If you have a really, really diverse floral garden, you can just put them into a jar, collect them into a jar, and then shake them out in that natural space where it's something that you're that you're not specifically harvesting from. And it's probably, it's a really good idea to have these natural spaces. So yeah, the great cutworm. So how do you deter them? I really have no idea. Supposedly uh, the moths love compost piles and they like to live in there. And if you put compost on your, on your fields or on your patches like we do, then they uh, will live in there and they'll come out. Um, what I have observed is that by disturbing the soil, and last time I talked about weeding with that Japanese hand hoe, we will do this and we're going to go start doing it again uh, tomorrow because the ground is so saturated, it just needs some airflow in there. It's just, it's like, it's awful. It's not even clay, it's just mud. It just, it needs some, some air circulation so that when the sun comes in, it's not just hitting a top of a marsh. It's going to actually get deep, deeper into the soil. So when we do that, we do notice that we sometimes pull them up with the Japanese handheld, and then we can take them out that way too. But the best thing is to observe. I have a friend who says he goes out uh, at like 4, 3.34 in the morning with his headlamp on, and he looks, and, uh, <laughs> and he looks for them as they're chomping on his plants. So well, you can do it either way. Hold on, everybody. I just got to turn on the light. Okay, I'm back. Okay, so that's great cutworms. I'm going to continue on with these. Colorado potato beetles. Um, Colorado potato beetles, I was just mentioning, they have many different life cycles coming in. They will damage potato crops in no time. We probably have a big problem with him because not that far, not that far away from us, there's a huge potato farm about 5,000 acres, and I know they spray, and I know they have a ton, uh, so that's probably why we have them. But we just make the turn every day when we see the adults and it doesn't take very long. We have 12 50 foot rows of potatoes and we'll just walk the rows. And if we see the adults, then we'll take them off and then we'll look underneath for the larval eggs and the eggs we just kind of squish. Um, so you can you can go ahead and uh, do that and you will never catch them all, which is great because when you don't get them all and there are larvae, then the spine soldier bugs come in, the assassin beetles are there. And they're actually there now. It's very interesting. Usually we will have Colorado potato beetles already, but I think because with the inclement weather, they haven't showed up, but all of the other little friends are there. Um, and I think that that's, I, I think that's very interesting. They're just waiting. They're waiting for uh, the potato beetles to show up. So who knows? Maybe they're already doing the job. I mean, after a while, you never even know what's happening. If you leave it alone, things are going to happen for the benefit of all beings. So it's sure that if there's a plethora of some being, there's going to be other beings that are going to take care of that plethora in a natural system. Voila. Uh, another of the most notorious that I have, and I will talk about uh, what you all have. Uh, going on. Somebody wrote SVBs are really common where I am. Squash vine borers. Okay. And pretty much guarantee an early end for the zucchini harvest. So I use netting now to cover the squash pants. Works great. Which you can say, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. I would use that. And, and I will say that now. So for things like squash bugs, squash vine borer, cucumber beetles, cabbage worms, even flea beetles and aphids, um, eh, take out aphids, all the rest of those, putting an insect screen or even a row cover over your plants to the point just to when they're flowering or even letting a few flowers grow will deter those insects enough because those beings, they will migrate through. And if they don't sense that there is an actual 
plant that they can uh, squash plant, say squash vine borer or squash bug or cucumber beetle. If they don't sense that plant, then they're just going to continue on. They're going to go to somebody else's place. So the plants, I don't know if they smell them or if they see them or there's some kind of like uh, uh, insect radar that they have going on. But for sure, by putting a screen or by putting a uh, row cover, it will deter them. So yes, is that vegan? It's absolutely vegan. Keep doing it. Excellent, excellent. And that's my advice, the other advice for things. Now, somebody, somebody asked me if I should, how about Colorado potato beetles? Can you cover the, potato be, the potatoes for potato beetles? I don't because I have so many, but I guess you could. But because of the way Colorado potato beetles act, they do fly in, but then they just kind of land and then they kind of walk around. They might get underneath anyway. So yeah, my pleasure. Great for you. Uh, I will answer your question, peaches and sugar, some sort of bug in my garlic scapes. I have a feeling that it's a leak moth or leak fly or leak larva if it's creating a little hole. And then it kind of looks like uh, the garlic scape is oozing a little bit. Um, and there's a hole in there, then you probably have the leaf, they call it the leaf maggot, which is really an awful name. But I think it's probably the leaf lar um, the leak larva or the leak moth, but check that out. But just let me know if you have like a little hole in your garlic scape, and that's probably what it is. Uh, aphids, what to do about aphids? Most people, what they do about aphids is they spray. Um, these can be really bad. For us, the green aphids are not that bad big a deal. They get into the plants. They're there. You wash them off. It's the gray aphids that come in. And this one here in Quebec is the one, the only insect species that has devastated any of my crops 100%. And it always seems to be uh, my late turnips and my late uh, wintering radishes like black radish and my late watermelon radishes. They get into the leaves and they just feed and it really uh, decimates the, the viability of the root underneath. I read something interesting about aphids. Supposedly aphids and aphid infestations and aphid proliferation is, is uh, correlated directly with the amount of available nitrogen that your plants are picking up. So if you decide that you're going to give a lot of compost, especially when aphids proliferate, when it's really, really warm, uh, they really like that, and especially when it's a little humid. So if they're trapped underneath a cover or if you've got a little rain and it gets warm, you're going to start getting a lot of aphids. Um, they will, uh, and you have a lot of nitrogen in the soil, you've added compost, and people that add animal high animal manure composts or animal manures like chicken manure or actosol actually have a huge problem with aphids. And this was a research study that was done that they found that there's a huge correlation between the amount of nitrogen available to the plants and aphid populations. So if you don't want to have a little bit of less, use your veganic compost. It shouldn't be that, that, that high in nitrogen, um, but it's going to give you all the other elements and the minerals that your plants will need still give a little bit of nitrogen. But I think that's why for me, I always have had a problem with those because I tend to um, put a lot of compost down for those crops because I think they're, they're very heavy feeding where in the end, maybe they would do, do just fine if the soil was a little bit more, uh, a little bit less nutrient dense. There you go. So that's what I know about aphids. The other interesting thing about aphids is that aphids exist just in nature and you can see them on uh, native flora everywhere. So try to find what's called a trap crop. A trap crop is a crop that you would plant specifically to get those insects to go to that specific crop. Bok choy works really, really well. So if you're trying to get aphids out of another patch, you can plant some extra bok choy, let it go up to get nice and green and leafy, go up to flower, and the aphids might just go inside. It's also really beneficial for cabbage worms because cabbage worms really like it. So you were talking about um, the general, the person was talking about squash vine borers. And if you put an insect screen over your brassicas all the way until say your broccoli goes to head or your cabbages go to head, you're going to block those cabbage worms, uh, those cabbage moths from coming in and laying their eggs and, lay, and, and having their little worms hatch because it's not the moth 
the moth is going to lay 15 to 20 eggs into the center, into the head of the cabbages. And then when those larvae come out, they're just going to eat. And this is usually what the problem are. Yeah, so Chris says, the aphids in my garden tend to stick to one plant. I leave the plant alone. They leave the other plant. Exactly. That's usually what it is. What I noticed here is gray aphids, which can become very prevalent like they were they really love the native vetch. So I just leave patches of the native vetch and that's where they go. And of course, because ants like the juices that the aphids produce, they will actually harvest the, harvest the aphids. They'll round them up and they'll, they'll kind of put them into one place. So it's very, very cool the way this all works. And if you just take the time to observe, and again, no spray. You don't spray, then you have to, you, you're almost forced to observe what's going on to try to make a better, uh, to make better decisions on what we're doing. Sometimes you do have to rip the plants out. And if you do, again, my, and, and you don't want to leave it right on the soil because maybe you want to replant a cover crop or something like that. If you do end up taking a plant out of your garden and you don't use it as, as in-bed composting, well, put it in a place that's close to your garden because then those aphids will continue to proliferate. And then the, if it's an infestation, let's say, well, then whatever beings like those aphids are gonna find them. And then those beings are gonna come around every year because again, like the birds, if an insect likes and has everything it needs, it has a food source, a water source, enough shelter and everything else he or she needs to thrive, then they're gonna come back. It's very simple. It's really not that hard. I, I Wish agronomes would listen to us. Cucumber beetles. Yeah, this one is really tough. Um, cucumber beetles are interesting. Where the Colorado potato beetles, they'll just look at you and you can take them off. Cucumber beetles will look at you and fly off. Like they know. They, they're that smart. They look at you and they take off. But I learned something interesting about cucumber beetles being up here in Quebec. If you can go out early enough in the morning, here it's dewy. I know in Northern California or not, but I would think if you go out early enough, you might hit some mornings where it's 50 degrees, 55 degrees. And if you have, which is what, 10 to 10 to 13 degrees Celsius. And if you happen to have cucumber beetle problems, which they don't really have a lot of natural predators for the cucumber beetles themselves. However, cucumber beetles, they will subside over time. Uh, the cucumber beetles will... Um, congregate in the flowers because they're kind of dewy and it's just really what they like. So if you have a male flower, uh, and this is also part of self-pollination squash, so I'm going to stick on this for a minute, but if you have a male flower, uh, the stamen part of the flower, and you don't have too many female flowers with the pistil in it, uh, to pollinate, or you happen to have, you haven't happened to see the bees yet that are doing the pollination, we'll take the entire flower off and then dispose of it into another place. My feeling with cucumber beetles, you're really going to have to smash them because there's a ton. I mean, there, there'll be times where there's cucumber beetles in the hundreds of thousands. So again, you're not going to take care of them all, but if you do this in a few different places, especially where they're not, eventually what I find is they seem to get the point and they leave. And it seems like when they show up, which is after, right after I take the covers off, right after they're flowering, which is sometime in early July, for about three weeks, they're pretty pervasive. And then they just kind of go away. I will find them on leftover winter squash in the field. They've kind of gone underneath and they're kind of eating on the bottom of the winter squash, but they don't do much problem to the plants after that. So again, it's about observation and finding innovative methods to try to take care of the problems as best as we can. And, and just so we're not so squeamish, I mean, hand picking is the least exploitative way of dealing with pro insects that tend to be just too pervasive at a, and too furious at one point in time. When there's just a few, it's not a big deal. You don't even need to do anything. But if you do get all of a sudden, maybe a thousand or a couple thousand, like you can get with cucumber beetles because they just show up in mass. Well, you just need to, you need to give your plants a little help. Again, we want to eat those plants. We don't want to let them eat them all. There you go. Those are the few that I have. I'm going to stick on squashes for a minute and just talk about self-pollination of squash, which is something that I wanted to mention. So 
there are times when we don't have enough bees in our fields here. And I, I'm sure I've seen this in other places, but didn't observe it as readily. You can very easily pollinate your squashes by hand. It's extremely simple to do, and it's actually very effective. And during the time when there doesn't seem to be a big concentration of bees, or maybe I just don't have enough diversity of flowers within my, my zucchini patch, it's usually in the zucchini, not in the winter squash, um, especially here, like maybe next week when I'll take the row covers off, I'll just go out every morning and I'll find the male flowers, which um, have the stamen and find the female flowers with the pistol and I'll just take off the petals of the male flower and I'll just pollinate. And there's enough pollen on one male flower to pollinate two or three female flowers. So you can do that. And the great thing is when you're eating them that year and you're not trying to save seed, it doesn't matter how many different varieties you have of summer squash. You can have Cocazelle and Costata Romanesco and, and, and dark green and patty pan and uh, Ron Manis, and you can have them all. And then you can just, pollinate any one. You can pollinate a dark green with a rondiness and it will still create a dark green and a rondiness. Now, if you're trying to save seed, you can do the same thing. Even if you're growing many different kinds, you just got to make sure you have your nice patch of, say, rondiness summer squash. Take a male flower from a rondiness, find a female flower of another plant of a rondiness, pollinate it, and then close it up with a twist tie or uh, an elastic band. And then you'll have a true uh, and then you'll have true seed. So you don't only have to grow one seed. So there you go. Self-pollination of squash for your own eating. Self-pollination of squash for uh, guarding seed purity. That's what I have for that. That was a very, that was very, I don't even know if that was really a part of the show. It was just something I wanted to mention. I, I had it written down, but self-pollination of squash, sometimes it has to happen and that's how. Continuing on, a couple of more insect species, squash bugs. These were very prevalent that I had in, um, in Arizona. They cause a lot of problems. They'll suck on the plant and they'll wilt it outright. I had a lot of problems with them, but I didn't manage uh, row covers or insect screens all that well. And I think if I would have, then I would have eliminated a lot of the problems. So use the insect screen or the row cover, and you should be able to find these either online through a good seed company, through a good nursery, through a good garden center. Uh, tomato or tobacco hornworms. Yeah, these guys are amazing. They are so intense that when they get on your tomato plants and you see them and you'll, and you'll notice because the tomato plant can get defoliated in just a couple of days. But usually what you'll see in the morning is a huge pile of worm poop on the bottom and right on the other underside of the leaf and they're quite camouflaged is the worm. And they can get to be like five centimeters long. And what's really intense about these guys is if you go try to pick them off, they'll stand up on their hind legs and they'll chatter at you. Like, <laughs> I mean, it is quite intimidating. So uh, <laughs> quite amazing. These guys you need to pick off. You need to take them off. And if you don't take them off, uh, if you have them, uh, then again, you'll have, uh, you'll, you'll have defoliated tomato plants very, very fast. Now here in Southern Quebec, we haven't had quite... Um, we haven't had them yet. I did see one walking on a forest road a couple years ago, but that's what we had. So that's what I have. So I guess I could talk about dehydration. I'm going to go over about three minutes, but I, and if you need to go, go, and you can watch it on the replay. But let's just talk a little bit about dehydration. So after you get your plants start coming in and you're trying to figure out what it is that you're going to do with the extra. My favorite is to dehydrate it. One of my favorite methods, especially for things like fresh herbs, uh, also tomatoes, uh, summer squash. We love to, to dehydrate. Uh, also any kind of fruits like, like pears and apples and and uh, mushrooms. And somebody asked me if it uses a lot of energy and it really doesn't. I mean, I don't know. I haven't calculated it. And can you dry another message? Yeah, you can use your oven or you can hang the bunches of herbs up. But what, what we notice, and usually my wife, Melanie, she does most of the dehydrating and she'll go out in the, after the dew is settled. So maybe about 10 o'clock in the morning, she'll cut, say the herb she wants to cut to dry, say, uh, lemon balm or thyme or oregano, and she'll just sit it on the kitchen table for a couple of hours. 
Well, it's already starting to dry a little bit. Then she'll strip off the leaves, put it on the trays. And what we have is what's called an Excalibur. I think they come in seven tray and nine tray. We have the bigger model, the nine tray, super efficient, really amazing system. If you're into drying, check it out. I'm sure they're quite expensive now with everything, the price of everything is going up, but check it out if you can. So yeah, I'm going to run over about three minutes. I'm sorry, everybody. Um, and uh, then she puts those on the tray. She puts it in and within just a couple of hours, they are dry, dry to a crisp that she can then put it into. We, we, we put all of our dried goods into like mason type canning jars with just the normal type of uh, metal canning lids uh, reused over and over and over again, waiting until they're dry and then sealed up and everything lasts a year. And great thing about dehydrating is yes, you need energy to go ahead and dehydrate, but you don't need any energy to then um, store it. Kind of like canning, you need energy to can, but then afterwards you don't, better than freezing, let's say. And you can even do more stuff. You can do peppers, you can do eggplant, you can do carrots, you can do all the stuff for your soups. If you're doing beans, you can dry beans. You don't even have to put them in the dehydrator because you have dry beans. Uh, and yeah, Catherine, they were very expensive many years ago, nine drawer, and they are expensive, but they are, they are, worth the money. It's kind of like a Vitamix if you're into that kind of thing. Um, it's like, there's no comparison. But if you can find something else, sometimes you can find them used. Sometimes you can find it on Facebook Marketplace. Check them out. I'm going to answer a question and then I really probably should let you all go. When soft plant squash, does it work if both the male and female flower from the same individual plant? Yes. I wouldn't say if seed, but to go ahead and do it, yes. Um, absolutely. So it would work just fine. So that is what I had, I guess, like I said before, this is my favorite topic. I could have just talked for insects for about another hour, but I'm not going to keep you that long. Uh, events coming up, uh, learn how to, this is by Dr. Susan Craig, who was with us tonight, learn how to grow your own food, close spacing and companion planting. It's a Facebook event live, or uh, maybe it's a Zoom event. Anyway, check it out. Uh, learn how to grow your own food, close spacing, and companion planting. And then for us here, July 7th in two weeks, we're going to talk about the greenest times. This is when the, 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 the gardens look the best. And de disease and or nutrient deficiencies, how to understand, how to know what's going on with our plants while they're growing and hopefully thriving. So I wish you a great couple of weeks. I wish your gardens more proliferation. I wish you a bountiful harvest. I really wish you a good time. And thank you for joining me again. Peace and good night.